What is up, everybody? We are back with another performance experts. Ryan is someone that I met whilst I was working with 100 Thieves, and we noted out a lot about team culture, team building, and a lot of different things. Honestly, the scope is quite wide. So I'll, uh, you know, thank you for joining me, Ryan. I'll let you introduce yourself briefly before we just go into the topic of team culture, which is what I'm super excited to talk to you about today. Dan, thank you very much for having me on. And yeah, we did spend a lot of time nerding out about various different things whilst we were in the 100 Thieves compound. I thoroughly enjoyed those times together. Um, look, to everyone listening, my name is Ryan Scullin. I have a background in sport and exercise science and business. I studied at uh, Loughborough University and did a degree in sport and exercise science there. I then went on to set up my own business called G-Science, which was health and performance coaching for professional esports athletes. I led that for four years until we recently got acquired by Adimas Esports, who are the leading uh, performance and health coaching company in the industry. I now currently work as a performance coach and a business executive with uh, Adimas Esports. And most recently, I've worked with 100 Thieves. I was there in LA with Dan, and I was working across uh, Call of Duty, Valorant, Apex, and League of Legends. I've also recently just worked with Red Bull and ran some boot camps with Warzone and Fortnite players. And yeah, I've had the last kind of five, six years now in the industry working in the health and performance space, really focusing all of my time and energy on how can I improve the health, wellness and performance of esports athletes. Amazing. So yeah, a lot, a lot of experience to draw from, to, to speak to. And, uh, you know, like we said today, you know, we, we're going to be talking about team culture. This is obviously a really important and huge topic. It's quite a nebulous term. Uh, culture i think for a lot of people it's, it's one of those kind of buzzwords i think that a lot of people tend to throw around it doesn't have to be buzzword but it typically is used in that way because most people aren't able to really quantify it so we can we can start to do that um we, so with team culture obviously it's we all know it's important you know how you know how do you how do you think about this what what, what is what is this what is culture yeah great question i think it's probably one of the most important things that elite sports teams or even any team should really consider both business or or in a sporting context but i think a good place to start is by defining what culture actually is so it's kind of a complex term and there's many different ways in which you could approach it but in a sporting context the way in which i would view it is that it's a shared values beliefs norms and behaviors that really make up a team's culture right and i think what's important about culture is it's not necessarily like what we do, it's more about how we do things, right? And I think culture in sporting environments really sets the foundation for success. So I think it's kind of a hot topic now. You've probably heard a lot of people mentioning culture. I think it's the latest kind of buzzword, but to me, that's how I would define it. And the other way in which I, I would describe it in kind of a practical sense is, if I were to walk into, let's say 100 Thieves training room, what would I see there and how would I feel, right? What are those behaviors that the players and coaches are doing on a daily basis? So that would be my definition of culture and action. Yeah, so what would be some examples there? You know, is, is that a sense of, you know, feeling like the work ethic of the players, feeling the, you know, are they sort of jovial and having fun and positive? Like it's, it's like these types of feelings that you're, that you're, you're kind of honing in. So there's, there's positive ones. Um, so what are some positive ones and some, some negative ones that you might see? Cause I'm just asking this question because I think with these, this topic, especially it's, it does feel like you can, you know, you have these kind of higher level words, but it's like for the average person that's never thought about this, you're like, well, what does that actually mean? What are you actually seeing that I could see? Um, so that's, that's the question. So I suppose what I'll say now is when I'm speaking about these, these terms right and concepts i'm speaking from my experience as an esports performance coach in the space and also from other adding mass esports performance coaches who are working at the elite level you know we've worked across 45 teams now in the last six years so what i'll try to do is kind of give you some insight and education but at the same time some practical strategies and tools that you can also use if you're a coach or performance coach working in the space um, so to answer your question dan the way the way i would see good culture or examples of good culture would and you can literally choose whatever you want here but to me let's take a very simple thing so just a value of respect right so a positive um culture example here would be if, if our value is respect in the environment respect could be very simple as when someone is speaking i.e the coach the players are listening right they're not on their phones they're not all tabbing doing other things they're not distracted they're giving the coach their undivided attention right that's one example 
we focus on respect against the value. The second example there could be when it's time to scrim that everyone there has their ass on their seats when they're meant to be there, right? And our example of bad culture would be if everyone agreed that we were going to be there in time and someone kept showing up late, that's an example to me where the leaders haven't enforced that and don't have the high level of discipline and accountability. So the culture is starting to slip because the standards are starting to slip. That's just a very simple explanation and we'll dive a bit deeper into, into how you can set those standards and values here in a moment. Yeah, and, and I'll ask you too because I think, you know, what, what does it matter that someone's a, you know, a few minutes late? You know, what, what, what is the... What are this the series of of all the the chain of events that kind of you know all you know the chain of causality essentially you know expanded later into time that that it becomes something that's significant because in the moment it feels like oh you know it's a few minutes late what's the big deal guys come on oh yeah hundred percent and I think that that's the difference of the kind of champion mindset and just a very mediocre mindset and I think it's the role of a leader to help the players understand how those small behaviors actually play into the bigger vision or the bigger goal. Because if you're constantly cutting corners or constantly showing up late, it's those small behaviours that have an impact. So let's take the showing up late, for example. If I'm that player who's showing up late all the time, I'm showing to my teammates that I don't care. Okay, So if you're my teammate, Dan, and I'm constantly showing up late, how are you going to feel? Yeah, exactly. It's like, get the fuck off my team, bitch. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. anyway, it's an extreme example, but but yeah, yeah, definitely. I've, I've felt, felt that before. I've been on teams where... Um, I've had to cut people because they're not willing to put in the same level of work or take it as seriously as other people. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, those small, tiny little things, those do build up in the back of your mind if you're the players sort of who are turning up. So, and that, that, that's the, that resentment that's kind of simmering uh, under the surface. So that's, that's not good as well. And you might try less hard. Uh, that might be one outcome. You might try less hard because you're, you don't want to try harder than some, you know, this other person. Mm hmm exactly and that that's just one very small example but if that person kept doing that every day um day in and day out eventually over time your team's gonna blow up right because you're gonna start getting pissed off and frustrated you're gonna call them out and then it's gonna blow up right yeah so that's just very one very small example but i do think at the elite level you've probably heard the marginal gains philosophy right it's all about finding the extra one percent but in reality now like i'm a big believer in that you know success is not determined by talent right We've seen a prime example just recently here in the LCS. Like, look at FlyQuest. FlyQuest is probably, like, one of the most expensive rosters. And if you looked at their talent on paper, they should have won the LCS probably, right, based on, on who they had in that team. But in reality, when you have a, a collection of individuals who don't have that personal discipline, it's it's inevitable that they're going to fail, right, and you don't have proper leadership in, in that team. So going back to that initial question, like, why does it matter? Because it's everything, right? Those small behaviors, those small habits... They all add up. And if you, like, I'm a big believer in the same, right? How you do one thing is how you do everything, right? So if you're someone who constantly is showing up late, you're probably that same guy who's maybe not doing the extra set in the gym. You're probably that same guy who's not staying behind and doing the VOD review when you have to. You know what I mean? So when you start adding all those little behaviors up all together, the gap between you and the other person who is doing that work is going to really show by the time you step on that stage. And I think that if one player does that, that sets the precedent for the other players to be like, well, hey, Dan's showing up late all the time. If he's doing it, I'm not going to stick to this, you know, uh, standard that we all set that we're all going to show up because he's not doing it. I'm not going to do it. And then what happens is you all start cutting corners. And then when it really matters, when, the, when you've got to go out and perform, because you've done that so many times over a season, then ultimately you're not going to get the result that you want. Yeah, makes makes total sense. It's just all these small little things that certainly can add up and and i think i think the the fact that it is hard to quantify some of these things with with regards to culture it's hard to to just be like look at observe and beha behavior and be like okay this i'm going to categorize this i'm going to call it something and then that fits within this other thing and this other thing and then i now I have a system of these different things most people don't go around sort of you know quantifying things and then putting them in a framework which this framework would be you know col team culture within esports uh competition for example so, so it is, it's really interesting because, again, th these things feel like small, but if you actually start to really try to identify them and try to understand the impact that they can have um, o over the time, the amount of time you're playing and all the rest of it, it can really impact performance, um, the range of performance that's possible. Even like, as you say, if you have like a super talented roster, that super talented roster, while the talent 
is not or rather the the performance of that roster is not assured there is, is a range that they're operating within and you're trying to as a performance uh you know coach or specialist you're trying to get them to perform as close to 100 percent as possible but these these things that you can do wrong especially if you're not paying attention to what they even are those things will be knocking off a percentage point here or there of the potential performance on the game day so um yeah definitely uh really i think a, a good introduction as to how in depth a topic like this can really get. Um, so, where do you, where do you where do you want to take us next with this? Because we talked about, I think, some a good introduction really with some, I think, examples. And now people maybe are a bit more interested to to go deeper down the rabbit hole of what this really means. Yeah, look, I when I was writing up my notes here, preparing for this podcast, I really was thinking to myself, like, where do I start? There's there's so so many ways we could take this. But what I tried to do is kind of bring it into a framework. Because as I said, I want this to be not only interesting and entertaining for the the listeners, but I want it to be practical. So if you're a coach or performance coach or even a player right now, it might get you to reconsider how you're approaching building culture um, within your team, right? So the framework in which I like to use is I kind of see three key areas when it comes to building culture, right? So area number one is the environment. And how we set that environment is through setting those values and those standards um, of behavior that we talked about there, but showing up late just being one of them. And then finally, that sense of belonging, that every individual in that team feels like they want to be there and that they, they belong in that group, right? They have some sort of attachment or affinity to the team's mission, the team's goals, and that collective tribe, right? The second area I look at then is the leadership. One of the most underdeveloped areas in esports right now, in my opinion, is leadership. Right. You probably experienced your experience as well, Dan. Like you have coaches who have very, very good IQ, very mm -hmm. low EQ. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's the combination of both that's very important when it comes to being an effective leader. And the other thing that's a massive challenge right now in esports is that a lot of leaders don't like conflict. Right. There's a lot of people pleasing behaviors that go on within these environments and within these rooms. So it's very hard to be disciplined as a leader and hold your players accountable when you're very concerned about being liked by the group. Okay, sometimes as a leader, you've got to be bold enough to go out there and, and put yourself out in the line and say, these are my values, this is what I stand for, and I might rub people up the wrong way, but this is truly how I believe and what we need to do here and how we should go about it, right? So when we look at leadership, I'm really looking at leadership qualities. What, effect, what does effective leadership look like? What is the role of a leader within the team in upholding this culture? And then also, how do you maintain it, right? That's through the discipline, the embodiment of the values and the standards on a daily basis, the rewarding and highlighting those players who are doing behaviors that reflect that culture that you want in your team. And then finally, the accountability, right? How do we start empowering leaders in these teams to be effective themselves, right? So it's not about a coach-athlete relationship. It's trying to make the athletes themselves the leaders that then hold the other players together, right? And then the final area I look at is mindset. So in order to have a culture of like high performance and or inclusivity, I think what's very important is to have a mindset that is a champion's mindset, right? So what does that actually mean? The way I look at mindset in esports is it's kind of like that Kaizen term, right? Which is a Japanese term, which is called continuous improvement. No matter if we win or lose, the next day you should be getting up I'm doing the exact same thing, right? It's a mastery mindset of what can I do every single day to get better and improve as a player or as a coach. So that part there to me is about personal development, but also the collective mindset of the team, right? No one is bigger than the team here. We all have a role and responsibility and we're all bought into this mindset of growth development and working together to, to achieve this shared goal, right? So they're, they're the kind of three key pillars I look at when I'm addressing culture in a team. And then finally, if we take a step back and look at it from the bird's eye view of across the whole season. So what I've seen in practice, and I'm sure a lot of performance coaches who are listening right now or coaches will feel this right now. It's very, it's it's one thing to set the foundations in the preseason, right? We have these amazing workshops and setting our team values. People put up values on the wall. It's all hoorah, right? Great. We know what we stand for. But what happens when the fires start burning throughout the season? Okay, so step one is set the foundations, set the culture. Step two is the hardest. How do you maintain that culture throughout the season? And then finally, I always think it's important to reflect. Before we can take a step forward, we must understand how did we do against our objectives that we set at the start of the season? So there are my two frameworks, those three key pillars, and then the three different time points throughout the season. 
All right. Yeah. And, and I think, I think again, it's, I'm going to keep trying to bring things back to sort of practical examples for people. Um, because I, again, I think this stuff is really, really difficult to keep control of. Uh, for example, like, you know, the values, you know, values, again, there's another, uh, a seemingly nebulous term, but it is something that is, it underpins everything that you're doing as, as a team. And, and it's, it's something that often goes, um, I, I suppose it takes people unaware, they're unaware of, of it, essentially. They're unaware of what their values are. They're unaware of, of what the team's values are. And the, the problem with with something like like that is that you need to have this same pageness on the team of what you're all kind of trying to do and how you identify as a team. Because the identity of the team is very much encapsulated in, in what you value as a team, what you're trying to push towards. Uh, so whether that's, you know, punctuality, but something something as simple as like punctuality can become a part of the, your identity as, as, a, as, as how you identify as a player on that team. There's lots of things uh, to, to do with that, but with, without defining it and really sort of talking to people about it and, and making it a part of what is key um, to be on your team and to have everyone em embracing it. It's hard to really achieve achieve that kind of unity that you're looking for and th that kind of high operational standards that you're looking for. And then also, I think what's really key about, about this is, I think Ryan was talking about leadership. One thing that uh, often goes... Uh, goes amiss is that a lot of the leadership is expected to come from the head coach or you know the coaches uh whereas um the, the yeah I, I first read i think about this this uh this approach in legacy by james kerr which is like a really famous kind of it's like the bible really for team building i definitely recommend the, the book it's incredible it's about the the all blacks and why they were sort of the most successful team um in, in sports history and it is all because of their culture so it's really a book that's an investigation of what is their culture? How did they build it? You know, and it has all these kind of examples of what's happened over history and how they solve problems. So it's really compelling to read it. But you know, one of the things that they talked about is this idea of a dual management model. And what that basically means is, yeah, you've got the you've got the leadership of the team, um, like traditionally as you'd expect, you know, the, the coaches and so on, um, who are sort of telling the players what to do. But then you actually have okay, there's there's this element, there's this layer of who in the actual team of the actual team members, the players are also leading and because sometimes the leadership should come from them and they should hold their peers accountable or they should take initiative in, in specific ways and that's way more powerful for positive outcomes for the team and the team culture than it would be to just have the coaches be in charge of disciplining everybody all the time and holding those standards for the whole team so you can't actually have that happen for the players if they don't have a clearly defined sense of what is it what does it actually mean to be on this team and what what are you taking pride for in, in terms of the values that you have? Yeah, and I think that's super important. And maybe that's a good place to start is starting with values. So in practice, when I go to work with a team, um, typically I like to focus on preseason, right? And the first workshop that I will ever run will be setting our values and expectations, right? So in practice, what does that actually look like? Well, what I do is I'll sit down with the coaching and management staff beforehand and I'll say, okay, what are your personal values? And get them to reflect. And it's actually quite funny a lot of the time when you ask this question, they don't actually know because a lot of people don't think about their personal values. <laughs> and I think this is very, very important because if you don't know what your code of behavior is or your code of standards of how you do things and what is right or wrong, are you ever going to know how you want to coach these players if you don't know yourself? Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important place to start. So usually I get them to start by thinking about their own personal values. And then the second thing I do is I get them to discuss, okay, now that you know your own values, what values do you want to bring into this team environment? And what environment do you want to create for these players? So that's a shared exercise. And typically what I do is I get them to come up with maybe three values. And we'll go through some iter or iterations of that. We'll do some thematic analysis. And then eventually we'll come down to you know a value and then a statement about what behaviors or behavior reflects that value right so when you finish that workshop you should finish with or you should have an outcome of these are our three values and here is a list of behaviors that reflect those values and if we are living by those behaviors on a daily basis they set the standards for high performance in that environment does that make sense yes okay I'm with so you. when they when when they've done that then it's about okay well there's obviously players involved in this as well so what we do is when we're unified as a coaching staff and management staff, we then go to the players and we say, let's co-create this environment together. Okay, so it's very similar exercise is asking the players, you know, what is important to them? 
uh, what what are their personal values and what do they want to see in the team? And a very simple question you can ask players is, think back to a team that you had a really great experience on. Think back to a team that you had a really bad experience on and start thinking about what was the coaching like? What were the players like? What was the environment like? You know, was I scared to share my opinions? Were people always flaming me? You know, did people always show up late? Or on the contrary, you know, did we have a, did we always go out for team dinners together? Did we spend loads of time out or outside of the game together? Did we really have that strong bond and trust in each other and want to play for each other? So it's a really good reflective tool to get players to think back in their career and think about, yeah, on the times when I really enjoyed myself and enjoyed being part of that team, what was the environment like? So we'll go through and work together as a group now with coaches and players, and we'll put up, put forward the three values that the coaches brought in, and then we'll get the players to add in two more. And together as a group, we'll, we'll, we'll work it out and we'll say, right, okay, these are our five values that we agree will re represent us, our team identity for this season. And here are a list of behaviors that will reflect those values in practice. And together, collectively, these are our standards of excellence, our standards of performance that we will live by throughout this season. So that is like the very first workshop that I will do. And then what I would encourage coaches to do on the tail end of that workshop is have one-to-ones of your players. Now, when we get down to kind of steps right here, which is the reflection uh, at the very end, when you know what your culture is, it makes it much easier to hire the right people because you know what questions to ask and you can set the expectation and standards very, very early on so that that person who's coming into your team knows what they expect from the culture. But unfortunately, a lot of these environments don't even know what the culture is that they want, so they can't start to have those conversations until they've done this kind of work. Okay, so I'm kind of putting the horse before the or the cart before the horse there, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Go back to the coaches right now. So I'm a coach in a team and I've got these five players. I think to be an effective coach, what I've learned over the last couple of years doing this over the last six years is players really don't care how much you know until they know how much you actually care about them and how you can actually help them. And I think it starts with building authentic relationships and trust in that relationship. And a way in which you can do that or start that conversation is in the first, like, let's say, interview that you have with that player is really try to get to know them. So some questions you can ask is like, what actually makes you tick as a player, right? What are their motivations and hopes and dreams that they are trying to aspire to achieve in their esports career? What does success actually mean for them? Because success is very different for people. It could be finishing their career and having millions in the bank. It could be being the greatest of all time. It could just be being the best in their position in their league. Whatever it may be, try to understand them. And then also try to understand for this individual, like what support you need to give them to help them play at their best in this environment? Because everyone needs different things. We all learn differently. We all require different support. And we all will express that differently, our needs when we're under pressure as well. Some people, you know, turn up and some people are more open to talk about it. So really try to start having that conversation early on about what their hopes are, what their dreams are, what the motivations are, what potential barriers may stop them from achieving those things and start to build that relationship early on. Yeah. And that, that's because because then with that relationship, you can build trust and vulnerability and of well, the ability to be vulnerable by sharing these things and then feeling like someone can kind of help you through these things then allows you to have that trust and that trust is another sort of like you know underpin sort of foundational type uh, uh requisite to getting uh into have, having the ability to even lead um to, to have that ability to that that player can trust that you have their best interests at heart and that you can also uh you can also take them through something that may need to be confrontational or very difficult because this is something I think that you, you mentioned as well, like uh, the the difficulty with confrontation that is quite common, especially in esports. Um, just this sense that you know, in a team environment, you're going to have to have hard conversations. You cannot you cannot just be in this comfortable place. Um, so you need to be able to create relationships where you can do that and have good outcomes from doing that. 
so yeah that trust that vulnerability i think is super key so i, lo I love that you, you pointed that out because that's also something that's it's easy to overlook especially with um a lot of coaches who might get into coaching because i think much like you said they have like really good like you know a game iq essentially and the strategic part the tactical part they've really got that locked down but but are they putting in the same level of effort and importance on some of these areas probably not in most cases and would they know how to approach that also, again, likely not. Again, in esports, a lot of the coaches are younger and don't necessarily have that experience. Like I, I found that it tends to be the case that naturally, um, when you get towards you, the end of your twenties and you start to get into your thirties, that's actually when those more natural leadership qualities start to just kind of happen because you've had, again, not naturally life experiences and you have enough sort of time and distance from some of those life experiences to begin to sort of truly believe that you have the ability to to lead others and again you're leading uh you know teenagers and and people you know in their early 20s so if you are also in that same phase of life you're going to have an extra challenge having some of these leadership qualities that might come a bit more naturally later on so i think it's really key um that you that you highlighted that and the importance of that yeah I'm going to challenge you in that, Dan, because I don't necessarily <laughs> believe that just as we get older, we become better leaders because I don't think age correlates with leadership. I think leadership is, we could say it's innate or it's it's learned, right? And that's a whole podcast in itself, so we'll not go down that rabbit hole. But what I would say is that in order to become a leader or to see if you have traits of leadership, you need to be given opportunities to lead, mm. right? Now, I think about some of these young guys and girls in these environments, a lot of the time they haven't had those opportunities to lead because they haven't, I don't want to say being challenged because of course they have in, in, in a digital environment, I would say, or some of them may have been challenged in, in a sporting environment or or maybe they've been challenged in life, right? And, they, and they've, they've got that level of strength and resilience. But in terms of leading the team, a lot of them don't understand what good leadership looks like. And I mean, I worked with an IGL recently and... I asked him a very simple question. I, I was like, okay, reflect back in your, your career and your life. And I want you to go back to a time where you had a really good leader or an example of good leadership or a good teacher. And that individual couldn't tell me one, one example, which made me very sad um, because he's obviously had shit leaders and shit teachers if he can't actually draw on that. But if someone doesn't have a good template to work from, and they don't know what good leadership looks like, how can we expect them to be good leaders? And they've also not been given the opportunity to lead, well, you're not going to develop leadership skills just out of thin air, right? So one of the key points there is, and we're going to touch on this, I'd say, later on in this conversation, is that we must give these guys and girls opportunities to lead. And I'm not just talking about in-game, being an IGL and making calls and making plays. I'm talking about out of game as well. You know, can we put them in situations and scenarios where they can test themselves mentally and see what, what their leadership capability actually is? So although I do agree, experience gives you a different insight and perspective, um, and you do obviously develop more awareness, I would say. I don't necessarily think it directly correlates with leadership. You need the experience and almost be forged through the fire to actually develop those skills. Yeah, I might be projecting a little bit there. <laughs> um, but I love that you, that, that you expanded on it in that way because uh, you reminded me too that it would be very valuable for people to have like some of those examples of good leadership and where can they find some of those things. I think, you know, for me, one one book I really liked, um, I'm sure you can probably come up with a bunch of books too uh, that people could read. Um, I, I really liked Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. It's not the most... Um, complex thing in the world but it's it's an easy read and it i think drives home some of the most important aspects of leadership and and um and and it's kind of this almost paradoxical thing that that jocko willing talks about in that book where um yeah you know there's this there's this this concept that you have to you know have this ultimate responsibility this extreme ownership and that's just generally a good mentality for your life in general but it's also that if you're a good leader you're you're getting out of everybody else's way and you're enabling everybody to kind of just do what they're supposed to do and it's it's very much this this um you know good leaders allow everybody else to kind of lead and you can be like a good leader is someone that can be led as well as lead mm. type of thing and so i think some of those key takeaways from that book I've, i thought i found was quite powerful and eye-opening so i can if, if i have one book recommendation for leadership i could i could uh, throw that one out extreme ownership by jocko willing do you, do you have do you have one ryan that you that you would uh, <laughs> recommend i mean the 11 rings by phil jackson's a very good one 
Mm. I think from a sports coaching perspective, I think Legacy, as you mentioned, is another phenomenal book. Um, I think a lot of my leadership experience, though, for me anyway, like I've got, I've had been very privileged to have conversations with people in the military, elite level of business, and obviously in a sporting context as well. And I think one of the key things you just mentioned there is like, what is an effective leader? Right. What are the traits and characteristics of that leader? And a lot of people think it's the big alpha stand up in front of the room and commanding and saying, you do this, you do that. But it's actually not. And I think if we look at the role of leaders in this environment, especially when we look through the lens of culture, they are role models and they are the ones that literally dictate the environment because they have to embody the values and standards that they set. And they've got to live by those values and standards every single day to reflect to the players and the team. This is how it should be done. Right. So to me, effective leadership is actually saying, hey, we all agreed that this is what we're going to do. And I'm living it every single day because I'm taking ownership of this, you know, this culture in this environment. And I'm going to hold everyone else here accountable. So a good leader, in my opinion, is living those values in action. A good leader is being disciplined, not only with himself or herself, but also disciplining the rest of the group. And a big part of that as well is keeping everyone accountable. Right, keeping keeping the players accountable. Don't let them slip up on that. You know, oh, he just came in a wee couple of minutes late. That's fine. We'll let that slide. Bullshit. You can't do that because you let it slide once and it happens again. When anything like that comes up, you need to nip at the bud straight away. Right. And finally, to me, an effective leader is someone who is of service to everyone else. Right. Leadership is not about you. It's about the people around you. You are serving them. They are not there to serve you. And that's something that I actually learned a lot when I was CEO of G-Science for four years. I didn't have a Scooby-Doo what I was doing. And I learned a lot of hard lessons about leadership there and about my team and how to be an effective leader. And I really do think like an effective leader is about really understanding the people that you're leading, creating time and space to be there for them. And it's not just a, a check-in or whatever. It's literally like really trying to understand that individual and goes back to them set of questions at the start. You don't do that one interview and stop at the you know stop stop the rest of the season like a tick box exercise. No, it's 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 being there and staying behind the extra thirty minutes to check on that person after they've had the bad game. You know, it's it's showing up early and and being the first one in the room and and being there to welcome everyone and set the the, the example and the standard. You know, it's not about big rah-rah speeches or any of that there bullshit. It's really about human connection and being of service and empowering those around you. And to, for me as a coach, you know, my biggest success is when I'm able to work with an individual, help them understand where they're trying to get to and then give them the, you know, the skills, the knowledge, the tools, the motivation, whatever it may be to help them get there and just support them on that journey. And you know, I've said this to you as well, like the role of a performance coach is like a Sherpa. You know, everyone's got their efforts that they want to climb, but you got to climb it. I can't do it for you. I'm just there supporting you on the journey. So a good leader helps guide that person, but doesn't walk it for them. Yeah, that's, that's very well put. And I think, I think it, you know, it, it's again, another point where I can just re-emphasize the point that if you're just a player listening to this, you can you can transform your team or, or you can decide by raising your own standards and values that you need to find another team or, or a group of like minded individuals that will follow suit with the values that you're embodying. Because if you're if you're if you're again, like finding yourself uh, like you should you should always be trying to push the the standard of your values to a higher level. You should never be in a position where, again, that guy's like late all the time. So now you're considering having less, you know, lowering your standard of of of, uh, of values because, you know, this this person's late. Why am I even putting in as much time? So the correct response there is to hold that person accountable and hold them to the standard to meet you. You should never kind of lower your own standards. And if you kind of are aware of that, that happening, that's a huge red flag. And if you're an individual on a team and you're, you're, you're really feeling like, you know, things aren't going well, don't you know look to don't look outside of yourself you start raising your own standards and values and start trying to hold your own teammates uh, to those and even if you're not you know you're not the coach not the in-game leader you're just like the you, maybe you're the kind of uh, least the, the person on the team has the least kind of importance or, or, or you know is that you're the, like the support player or whatever it might be that is still a potentially powerful effect because you will inspire others with your values and you can you can always keep working on yourself you can always take control of of your own values and how you operate and that that should be something that can really be helpful even if you're you're kind of struggling and again if if your team is really not able to 
um, match your values, then you need to find find a new team um, ultimately because you're, it's going to be kind of a dead end, sadly. Because I've I've seen a lot of players go through this where they'll be with a group of people that they like, but they don't they can't really they can't really separate the, the the fun of playing with that group versus the goals that they have for themselves and their career, and they might get they might stay with the team that is not ever going to have the the same standards or values that they do and that mismatch will just it's just like it's it's, it's unfortunate but it happens um you have yeah. to be brave enough to to take the leap into the unknown to, to 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 go after what you are really valuing which is uh presumably like you know greater greater achievement mm -hmm. i actually think you've highlighted a really interesting point one of the most unique kind of challenges as a leader is how do you align a person's individual or player's individual interests and their goals with the team goals right and what happens when they don't align that's a really really common um challenge that comes up a lot of the time and i think it's actually something we should probably dive into a bit here as well because we kind of we went from values there straight to the leadership but one of the things we missed which is a very important point is before we, we kick off the season, we need to know where we want to go. So what is that shared goal and what is our mission? So in my opinion, how I look at this is when we set goals, we're looking at where do we want to go? The values is how do we get there? And then what I ask players is if you win a championship and you look back on that 12 months of hard work, how did you show up and how did you act as a man or woman throughout that period? Because that really determines how you won and like the value of that win, never mind just winning. And I think there's a really important point here as well that when I look at performance, it's capability plus behavior that equals the performance. And it's the behavior part that I'm fascinated about. And that's why the values are so important and the culture is so important because our environment that we're in, the characteristics of that environment will dictate 70% of our behaviors. Mm. So you can see why it's so important that we set up the right environment because that's going to drive the behaviors of the team. And if the behaviors is a massive part of the performance equation, then we need to make sure that we're encouraging and rewarding the right behaviors. And that's another thing that we I didn't mention there about leaders. One of your responsibilities as a leader in this team or in a team environment is if I see Dan showing up every single day and putting in hard work, if I see Dan stand behind and doing his fault reviews, like I'm, I'm going to talk about Call of Duty here because it's my favorite esport and what I've got most experience in. But if Dan is stand behind before a big tournament, he's looking for need spots in S&D, the X are 1%. Next time we come in, you know, I'm going to highlight that to the rest of the guys. Dan, that's absolutely excellent. You know, it's it's amazing you find these three and four new spots. Like that's, that's a, a behavior that I want to celebrate and reward because then you've got the other players going... Dan's putting in the extra work here. I'm I'm slacking. I need to be doing the extra 1% as well. And if you create a team culture and mindset of like, hey, we're all going to do the extra 1% and you have, you're getting positive reinforcement for doing it, it just further reinforces that behavior. So leaders have a responsibility to highlight positive behaviors that they want to see in the environment. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so that's a very important component there. And then the other component of that kind of performance equals... Uh, capability plus behavior is character. So as a coach, I think your role and responsibility is not only to win, because ultimately in esports, everyone cares about winning. You're, when you sign on as a GM, Dan, your goal, I'm sure your role and responsibility was building the roster, win championships, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Right? But a key component of that process is obviously establishing this culture for success. But also, when I look at player development journeys, I don't necessarily care as much about the in-game. Obviously, it's very important. But what I care about is, who is that person behind the gamer tag? Who is the authentic version of you? And what I want to try to focus on as performance coach is, how can I help that individual become the best version of them in game and out of game? How can we create better human beings, right? Because the old saying in the All Blacks is, better people make, or better players make better All Blacks, and better All Blacks make better people. Right. So I'm always thinking about that is how can we role model the behaviors? And the one I always talk about is in the All Blacks, you have the senior leaders who will sweep the sheds. So when you finish the rugby session and there's muck all over the floor, in an esports uh, example, our environment is in a training room or after a tournament, you know, when you're uh, 
at LAN and you're in your training room and you've got door dash everywhere and you've got your energy <laughs> drinks, whatever. Guess who cleans that up, players? It's me and Dan. <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's one of the things that pisses me off because I'm not your mum or dad. I'm not here to wipe your arse, right? You should be taking ownership of yourself and of that very simple thing. And if you don't respect your environment, that's just is another example of poor character, in my opinion. So you've got some of the greatest All Blacks of all time, like Richie McCaw, and they're the guys who've got, you know, they've got the brush and they're cleaning the sheds. They're cleaning up after everyone. So I think a really important thing is, if you're a player listening to this, think about your character. Like, who do you, how do you want to show up every day? What type of man or woman do you want to be? And remember, no one is too big to sweep the sheds. And that concept alone is something that we can expand upon because typically what gets in the way of that, Dan, what do you think gets in the way of sweeping the sheds with most esports players? Uh, oh, that's laziness. Um, also, also like not seeing it as part of their role, not seeing it as part of their job, not, uh, not, not necessarily thinking they're too good, good for it, but just th thinking that like someone else will deal with it. Correct. It's an entitlement and it's ego. And it's because everyone's done everything for them. And I think that's where setting the culture, setting the standards at the start of the season, you put that in as one of the behaviors, right? You got to take care of yourself. You got to be responsible for yourself. And in my opinion, that's an example of a true professional, right? You sweep the sheds, you take care of yourself. You don't expect other people to take care of you. Yes, I'm, not a... that, I'm, not, I'm not saying that these you know players at elite level don't need support. That's why they have the best performance coaches, physical therapists, trainers, nutrition, everything there but there's simple things that you should be responsible for and i think that's just one example yeah I, I, this is the first chapter of legacy i think uh for those of you that haven't read the book uh but definitely recommend it and one of the other things that uh that they say in that chapter about about this behavior as well is 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 is, is, is taking pride in the sense of no one looks after the all blacks except the all blacks so that's like a part of the team value wow. like going back to the the values and and I, and I love that because that's actually really powerful. It's like we're we're such a powerful group of of humans that no one is is it's no one's job to look after us, but we will do it. I don't know. There's there's, there's like a reframing of it in a sense there, where it's not this kind of busy work that's kind of you know dull, but it's actually empowering to the identity of like the team and the fact that you guys take pride in in your conduct um, and that that empowers you further. So I, I always, when I read that, I was like, this is, that's fantastic. That's that's a, absolutely the right way to think about this stuff. And, and it's, and it's all those, it's also all about the small things. It's about never being too big to do the small things, no matter what that small thing is, because really that, that, you know, the sweeping the sheds is also a metaphor for doing all of the small things that you don't want to do that don't feel like they're important, but it really adds up. It adds up in this sense to your to your character and your sense of pride and identity, but doing the small things like finding the extra nade lineups, spending that extra 20, 20 minutes a day is something that, you know, yeah, you could, you know, you don't have to do that. Yeah, maybe your coach or analyst or something, someone would, would do that because you're not doing it. But if you do it, you're going to remember it better. You're going to feel more prepared. And that psychologically is powerful in terms of your performance on, on the day. Um, and so there's all these like tiny, tiny little uh, edges that you can get. And there's this other concept in the book. I think, I think they call it like a hundred edges or something like that, or where they basically like, okay, you, you list, they list a hundred like tiny things that you could do better now. Okay. If you, and if you put all those things together, you have a big edge. So, um, you know, I think it's it's uh, although it's like quite a simple thing. I think that that concept is quite powerful. So I love, I love that you brought up, brought up sweep the sheds. <laughs> and I think actually we could maybe spend five minutes here and just talk about the All Blacks as a prime example. I mean, I'm hurting quite a lot right now because Ireland just got put out in the World Cup quarterfinals by the All Blacks, and it's probably <laughs> one of the greatest Irish teams of all time. But it just goes to show what that team is capable of doing. Um, and I've always admired the All Blacks and. Another thing that I've been absolutely fascinated by recently is culture and tribes and sense of belonging. And I think New Zealand rugby have done this so well for the last you know, 15, 20 years in particular. There's an interesting story, though. Um, when the All Blacks won the World Cup in 2011, they had a bit of a predicament, right? Because typically when a team wins a World Cup, and this is so common in esports, it's unbelievable, right? When a team wins a big championship, what happens next, Dan? They they just come off the gas and they lose. Yeah. <laughs> they and sometimes yeah. lose in like magnificent fashion. Like they'll just they'll get 100%. they'll get grouped by a random team. Yeah. Why why is that? Do you think? 
uh, it's because there's a there's a there's a philosophical shift in thinking of of ch like going and ch chasing whoever is the best and chasing after the the trophy versus being the best and then having to it's a complete philosophical shift to then have to be able to to be chased after mm -hmm. chasing so totally different ball game and yeah most teams mess it up <laughs> yeah. in fact i think almost i've i've actually only seen one team not mess up in i think like truly yeah in tax shooters it's at least it's it's so common in esports, right? A team wins a major, and it's very unlikely that they go back to back. And it's very very true that what you said. It's it's the psychological shift. The pressure's off, right? All the pressure and expectation you had on on your team to win, you're like, oh, thank thank God it's over, right? Thank God we finally done it. And that edge that you had, that edge to get you up early in the morning to do the extra rep, to do the extra vault review, to go you know, do whatever it may be, that extra behavior, it goes. And you've now kind of settled in that we're a champion, right? We, we are the champions. You can take your foot off. I'm going to share a quick story with you on this and then I'll bring it back to the All Blacks. But I started working with 100 Thieves Call of Duty team, LA Thieves, uh, just before Major 4. So we actually, funny enough, using this whiteboard here, very similar to the setup, I was doing some remote work with the guys. And we were talking about performing under pressure before Major 4. And of course, we go in and we, we win Major 4, and I'm like, fantastic, right? What a great way to build some momentum as we're getting closer to the end of the season. So after we win Major 4, I messaged the guys being like, hey guys, um, you want to schedule another session? Redo silence. I'm like, okay, <laughs> great. The league, the online league starts up, and the guys go 0-1, and one, I'm like, hmm, could have seen that one coming. So quick message into the group being like, guys, obviously disappointing result. Let's let's touch base and uh, get back on track again. Radio silence again. What happens next? They go zero and two. And I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna wait and see what happens. What happens next? They go zero and three. And then finally, you're like, holy shit, we need a workshop. We need to get back on this again, right? And it just amazes me the mindset. Like complacency is the biggest killer. And just because you've won something once doesn't mean you're going to win it again. And I think that is the thing that frustrates me most in esports is don't forget what got you there. When you've made, when you've been successful and you have that hunger and that desire and that drive, think about the process leading up to that. What were the habits and behaviors that you did that enabled you to get there? Just because you win, you shouldn't just stop all of that, right? As Kobe Bryant said, it doesn't matter if you win or lose the next day, I'm getting up and I'm doing the exact same thing. And I think this is a really important mindset for the leaders in these environments to have in esports is that it should be a performance driven environment, but it should be results orientated. Right. And what I mean by that is the results are obviously win or lose, but the performance driven aspect is all about mastery. So we should constantly be asking ourselves as leaders in these teams and as players, I can't really control the outcome of these games. Right. We cannot control if this team's going to show up one day and just smoke us. But what we can control and what should be our objective as a team is how can we play consistently at our best every game? Right. How can we play to the peak of our potential every game? And then you break that down into the individual habits and behaviors and skills and attributes that you need to do that. That should be the goal, the performance driven goal. We are in control of that because it's about us. It's about our performance. We're not saying that we need to win this game, the outcome goal. We're talking about the performance goal. And I think it's a very misunderstood concept in esports. Everyone focuses about the winning, but they don't focus on about the performance and how you get there. And if you really break down that process and are intentional about your training, you'll understand that you need to reflect on what are the biggest areas that we can find for improvement and we need to put more time and effort into them. Because if we do that and we keep developing and building our strengths and find out and understand as a team what that our best performance looks like, that's going to take us a step closer to winning. And ultimately, if we do that on a daily basis, the results do take care of themselves. It's it's the it's the paradox, and I I talk to people all the time about this because it's it's this like fractal concept that exists like in every single aspect of performance. That if you're thinking about the outcome, if you're if you're in any way judging anything off of the outcome, you're just inherently gonna put yourself at a disadvantage. And it's the process that's everything. And and so and it's so hard because you know like he, no one's no one's getting you know all hot and bothered over the process, but people. <laughs> <laughs> but people are getting obviously really excited about the wins because that's what really articulates your career and and how you when know, people are like looking you know in, in the history books and and on you know Wikipedia or wherever it is they're gonna you know you'll be you'll be able to say look well I won this thing and that's like 
in, that is the thing that memorializes your work in time. And so that's what you're looking to to get. But the thing is, is that's the key factor is it memorializes your work in time. So the only way to really achieve that is by is by being better at the process than everybody else. That's and, and so that's that's the thing you have to fall in love with the process and forget about the results. And as, as yeah, as you're saying, right, you got to let the results sort of you know take care of themselves. Um, yeah. But but it's so it's it's just so against the natural human psychology to think this way. So you have to realize that your brain is 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 trying is not tr actively trying to there's not some i mean it's not some malicious entity in there trying to mess you up um other than i suppose like maybe if, if you go down the rabbit hole of you know evolutionary psychology and, and behavioral psychology but at the same time like you have to be aware of the ways in which your brain might be sabotaging some of your progress and this and there's very very common issues here so it's a super important thing to think about and i think maybe we can talk about in like future conversations like just process just as an entire standalone because i think it's really important and there's and and i'd even i don't know if you, if you can speak to it but i, I understand you know I've, I've heard huberman talk about this at length you know the dopaminergic system and how you know it's essentially kind of the neurological reward system um for for you know process versus reward so we can even hopefully even get into stuff like that so uh process is really important <laughs> 100%. And I think yeah, there's so many different areas there that we can touch upon. Um, but I do think that's probably a separate podcast list. We yeah, yeah. The whole. Um, <laughs> so, something I want to mention here that that is kind of challenging. Um, to your point, Dan, on on esports because it is a bit of a re-education because everything's about winning. And I'm I'm a realist, by the way. Like you need to understand how how these teams work. So I, hopefully you can speak on this a bit as well. Like the reason why it's so difficult to build culture. In these teams is because you're in for one year and you're out for the next mm. and I've, th I, I, I've been working with 100 cities for eight months um five of those were remote and three of those were in person i had these huge expectations on me to go in and like build this world-class culture it simply cannot happen in three months mm -hmm. you know these types of things take a lot of time and the best case study in my opinion is matt fisher who's one of our performance coaches here at adimas and nysl you know three years ago everything was on fire there and it took Matt three years of doing all the stuff we've just talked about there to actually get to the point where they won three out of the six major tournaments and then in finals they won 5-0 and absolutely smoked Toronto Ultra in the finals it was one of the most dominant performances of all time but the thing they attributed their success to was team culture and amazing in a nutshell yeah um but I, I think in esports, the challenges we do have, we just want to talk about a few of them, and I'd really love you to speak on your experiences. So this is the high turnover rate means it's very, very difficult to maintain a culture, right? Because we talked about leaders are the main drivers of the culture in these environments, but what happens when then, then leaders go? Who's your cultural champion now? So all the work that you did that season goes with that person, and else you've got a strong enough culture where that knowledge has been shared and the leaders have been upskilled and empowered to hold that culture. That's one of the biggest challenges. The second thing is when we talked about setting our goals and our mission at the start of the season, a lot of the time when we've done these exercises, it's performance driven, right? It's about winning championships. That's usually the goal. But the reality is in esports that in order to survive from an economic standpoint, the players have got to create content. So when content is king, performance takes a secondary and it's very difficult to focus 100% performance when the players are constantly being asked to do content and do promotions and do shoots and stuff like that there. So it's conflicting goals, if you understand what I mean there. Mm -hmm. where performance is what we've said we're going to do from an operational esports standpoint, but then the business is like, no, the guy's got to create content as well. So it, it's kind of conflicting ideas, which makes it very, very challenging. And then I think that the final kind of nuance point that always interests me is in esports, I feel like there's not a lot of loyalty to the team. And I feel like players are very much ego-driven. It's very much about them, their brand, their success. When we look at the All Blacks, if you ever have the honor of putting on an All Blacks jersey, they talk about the concept, which is called Fuck a Papa, right? And it's, it's all about legacy. It's all about that you're off service to this jersey. It's never about you. You've got to pick up this jersey, put it on, and by the time you take it off and the sun is set, on your time it's your responsibility to leave it in a better place and they talk about you plant trees that you'll never see grow that's what great leaders and great servants to the all blacks do they pass down the knowledge they pass down the skills the stories to empower the next generation of leaders it's about the team it's about the collective it's about the tribe 
in esports, I feel like there's absolutely no loyalty to teams. It's very much about the individual. And I think that's one of the challenges when it comes to building legacy and culture in these teams is that you simply don't have that. Yeah, so, yeah I mean, <laughs> love, love to get your thoughts on all of those points. It's, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot, a lot there. I mean, we've got our final ten minutes, so we'll see, we'll see what we can can what ground we can cover there. But I, I think it's really, really difficult because there's so many, as you mentioned, there's so many forces working against players and teams to achieve yeah. this. You know, firstly, like you said, you're kind of sometimes expected to have a second job as a player. So, and and also because the the lifetime. Of, of a player as in a as a career is is you're kind of worried i would say most players i mean i don't know if most players are actively thinking about it whether it's in the back of their heads or not but what is the average lifespan of an esports player in the tier one it's it's very short and you know i had um casey uh who's from one hp who was who said he, he sort of ran like a um an analysis uh, you know a while ago just sort of just seeing like how hard is it to actually be a professional esports player and and uh, you know he he's essentially kind of came up with the the number in in what he did of like okay this is actually seems like it's like four to five times harder to be an elite level esports player than a traditional sports player in like a in a, like a you know pro team there and if you're in a pro team in in rugby or otherwise you're probably I don't know a lot about it you can probably speak to this more Ryan but you know you're going to be probably able to have a career that goes at least a decade or more like you know you're you're at least going to be having some amount of stability in in that world where you can rely on a salary you can rely on having the the you know time to actually get better and to perform and and, and these kinds of things so there's more stability at least at the very least i don't know is that is that true uh yes and no i mean unfortunately in certain sports injuries are high risk right you know if you're a rugby player you go out the saturday and you break your leg and that could be a career ender for you so there's there's sometimes higher risk in terms of high impact sports I definitely think, yeah, there there maybe is more longevity, but like anything, right? It's all based on form. If you're mm. not playing well, you're not gonna you're not gonna be on the starting team for for too long. But I, I think, yeah, from from a from an esports perspective, yeah, don't get me wrong, it's incredibly difficult to to get to the top and to also stay at the top. And that was one of the points I was gonna make there about the All Blacks as well is. It's one thing to be good, as in winning the World Cup in 2011, but to be great, to go and win it again in 2015, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, I, and I think that's, that's a really interesting thing for players to consider, is like, if you're part of a team that's been successful, typically the team gets broken up and everyone goes elsewhere. But why not stick together and try to actually do something that's never been done before? Why not try to create a legacy? And that's kind of like one of my calls, the actions, the players, is really think about that. And I understand it's not that simple, right? There's contract negotiations, there's salaries. Obviously, we're going through a, a bit of a reset right now for, for players, but it depends what you're driven by, right? If you want to be the greatest of all time, you got to put yourself in a position by being the best team that has the most talent and the right infrastructure to give you that. If you're sheerly money-driven, well, go after the bag and fair play to you. You know, you've made a living for yourself. So it just depends what your drivers are. Yeah, and and I mean, there's and there's so many other aspects too as well as to why it's tough to have this longevity with teams. It's also because teams have in esports a lot of really bad leadership. There's lots of teams that have horrendous leadership. It's impossible to have respect for, you know, for some teams. Uh, for, you know, there's lots of players on various like organizations where they it's impossible for them to respect the way that they're that they're, they are treated by the org, for example. Um, and 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 the thing is, is that it's not. It's not to say that you need to treat players like they're royalty or anything like this, but it's it's about just good business practices, treating them with respect, having good communication, you know, having you know tr transparency in the in the places that make sense. Just just doing stuff right as opposed to treating them like royalty. Yeah, um, is that is really and setting the expectations from the beginning that the, what the treatment will be and then to follow up on that i think like yeah. just doing that is very difficult in esports and it's because obviously like the orgs struggle to have a business model that makes money a lot of the orgs you know were sort of overpaying and uh, for for salaries and artificially inflating them and there's bad business practices and and there's lots of less lack of stability so there's like all these forces that certainly as you say like really make it very difficult to have it be the case that the the team itself is is the is the um uh, what's what's the what's the term? I've, I'm, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. But basically, the team is is the you know you're, like you said with the All Blacks, it's this institution that you're. A priority. 
Yeah, that is. The, yeah, exactly. And and so you kind of have to look out for yourself a bit more in that in that sense. And it, and it's so yeah. so within like each because also the orgs have multiple different teams too. Yeah. So that and then so and each team might be run very differently. So you have to also work within the vacuum of your kind of team. So it's that's also kind of weird as well. Yeah, for sure. And I know there's going to be cultural nuances between, let's say, Valorant, Call of Duty, or League of Legends and COD or whatever. They're totally different esports, right? But at the end of the day, and this is what I, I was trying to fight for at 100 Thieves, is that it doesn't matter what scrim room I walk into, we should all be doing this, the same thing. As in, in terms of like our culture and our values and our expectations and our standards of behavior should be the exact same. It doesn't matter, like in the military, it doesn't matter what unit you're a part of, right? It's the same expectation across the board. Yeah, and I think that's what we should aim for, and I think that's the opportunity and the call to action here for business owners or owners, listeners, or coaches or players. If you really focus on building the right culture, the results will come. Yes. And the other thing as well, invest in your players, like trust in your players, trust in your staff, give them the opportunity to actually implement this. Because as I said, with Matt's case study, it takes three years. And something you mentioned there was really important. I didn't talk about. Um, I just want to quickly touch on is communication. To build a, a culture, right, you need to have psychological safety or an optimal culture, you need to have psychological safety. People need to feel comfortable to be able to share their opinions, to give feedback, um, and ultimately to, to know that their voice is important and, and to be heard. And if you don't have that, you're never going to have high performance. And I think that you need to understand, like, this is a high challenge environment, and therefore we need to have high level support. And we've seen so many horrible cases where players don't ask for help. And we've seen, unfortunately, people have taken their own lives when, when the pressure gets too high. Like, it's our responsibility as leaders, as teammates, to to be taking care or to be supporting these individuals, right? And, and try to help those individuals better take care of themselves. And I think a big part of that communication, or a big part of that is communication, right? Enabling an environment that people feel safe, where they can ask for help when they need help. And I think as well, to your point about orgs and business practices, a lot of it comes down to honesty and integrity. Be honest with people. Give them the opportunity to take the feedback. And it goes back to having the ability to have difficult conversations. One of the biggest issues that's holding people back in esports, in my opinion, is people pleasing. If you have something to say, think about how you want to say it, right? I always talk about the three T's, time and type and tone. And this specifically is for coaches when you're giving feedback to players. If the players made a mistake, they're usually their biggest self-critic. So when you're in a VOD review, try not to go straight in on them 100%, right? Think about the timing. Maybe we need to have a blackout period where you don't VOD review the game for at least 10 minutes to let everyone's emotions regulate. Then the type, are you giving them informative or instructional feedback or motivational feedback, whatever it may be? And then the tone. The tone of voice is so important. If you start shouting at me, I'm going to shell up or I'm going to get in your face as well. So being thinking about those three things are very, very important. Um, and then the final thing I want to talk about, uh, just when building the culture, right, and the sense of belonging, because this is the most important thing. Being able to go in that scrim room every single day and be excited to be there, feel like you're a part of this team, you understand the mission, you know what the values are, you have a shared identity. Some of the exercises that you can do, um, it's is there's a really good exercise, right? And this is going to make people feel very uncomfortable. And that's why I really like it. <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't ran this one yet, but I've run a, 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 a similar um, iteration of it. Matt and Scott, who are two performance coaches, Abby Matt's recently ran a workshop called If You Really Knew Me. And you can imagine how powerful this workshop would be. So you have a bunch of young men sitting around in a circle together. And you're, you, you can basically preface it by saying that like, you can go as deep and be as vulnerable as you want. But you really ask them, you know, share your story, share the difficulties you've overcome, share what who is like who you are today and what 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 got you there. And Matt said it was one of the most powerful experiences he's ever had as a performance coach, you know, doing that with the team. And at the end they all had a big group hug, right? And they had tears, you know, coming out of these young men. A lot of the time in these environments, people just want the ability to be seen, right? To listen to their voice, to feel like they are safe. That's such a powerful experience for young men in today's society are typically told to suppress their emotions. And I think if we can create that stability and that and and that that psychological safety and allow people to be truly vulnerable, that's where you have the deepest connection. And when you have deep connections and show you truly care, that is the foundation, in my opinion, of true high performance. Because if you know I really care about you, Dan, when I'm giving you that feedback, you know I'm doing it because I want you to get better. If you know I really care about you, when you ask for help, I'm going to be there because I'm a good leader in the team and I'm there to serve you. 
And if you know I really care about you, I'm going to challenge you every single day and hold you accountable to be the best that you can absolutely be. And if you do those things and start with genuine care and trust, then you can achieve greatness, I think, in, in esports. So I think there's some really important examples. And here's just a really funny one you can do as well. I did this with Team Heretics. The guys didn't really know each other very well. So we did speed dating. So we set up, you got to sit with each player for five minutes and you just rapid fire questions. And you can imagine putting some awkward gamers together who've never met each other and just be like, guys, three, two, one, go speak to each other. <laughs> and the laughs we had after after doing that session was was absolutely amazing. So yeah, to me, when you're, when you're a performance coach, you're a leader and you're building the roster, right? Usually the first time that the players meet each other is going to be in game. And they're automatically judging each other based on their expertise and is this person good is he bad is he going to be a good teammate whatever all that's bullshit where you really need to start is out of the game focus on the individuals build that trust do team building activities outside if it's escape rooms if it's going to work out together and suffering together that can really build true connection but find ways to connect out of the game and get each other to understand each other uh, at a humanistic level and then you can bring it into the game and that's where you really build better teamwork, better communication, um, better understanding, trust to make those big plays when it really matters. And ultimately that's the underpinning of high performance. Awesome. That's a, and that's a great that's a great spot to leave leave us off, I think, for today, Ryan. Um Thank you again so much for your time. Um, I, I mean, it's, I already knew this, but I feel like we there's like so many of these that we that we can and probably should do. It's, it's like a lot of fun talking about these topics. I don't think anyone else is really talking about these topics. So why not us, hey? Um, so so yeah, when are you coming back, Ryan? <laughs> well, look, we'll see, see what the community says. But no, I absolutely love chatting about this. Like it really is uh, a passion of mine. And I had a lot of notes here today and we only covered probably about 30%. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's that. Um, yeah. Awesome. So what, what I would say is yeah, if anyone is interested in learning more about culture or leadership or any of these concepts that I talked about today, please feel free to reach out to myself or Dan and there's a load more that I, I can send you and share with you if you want any practical tools or resources to do further reading or anything you want to bring into your team, so just just let me know. But I really appreciate bringing me on, Dan. Yeah. Do you have any anything you want to plug that you're doing that you want to like let people know about? What are you What are you up to? Yeah. I mean, if you want to follow me on Twitter, um, it's at esports Ryan. I appreciate any follows there. I'm going to start getting into a bit more content creation. So I'll hopefully be sharing more of the kind of knowledge and insights that I'm getting working with these teams at, at the elite level. I think as well, we at Animas have just set up a new community called Kaizen, but it's K Y Z N. And it's for gamers who are interested in self-improvement and performance. So at the minute, it's FPS focused. So if you're in the Valorant community or Warzone or Call of Duty or Apex, please feel free to join. We're bringing in guest speakers who are you know, pro players, pro coaches. I think Dan's going to come in and have a chat at some stage. Um, so we're really going to be having a lot of conversations around kind of health, wellness and performance and self-development and growth. So if you're interested in being part of that community, please feel free to join. Awesome. All right. Cheers, Ryan. Until the next time. Thank you very much, Don. Cheers.